Hi everyone, welcome back to our discussions on AP Physics C, Electricity and Magnetism. This will be the start of our Unit 3 discussions, which is about the electric potential and its relationship to the electric field. So first, let's consider the concept of electric potential energy. We've considered potential energy in many other contexts before back in kindergarten physics. So with electric potential energy, um, you can think of it as something in which work would be done by an electric field in a certain direction of motion. So let's recall the concept of work. Well, work from it, in the work done in moving a particle from point I to point F, initial and final, would be given by the integral of the force vector dotted with infinitesimal displacement vectors if the path happens to be a curve or something like that. But if the path is not a curve and if the force is constant, then everything plops out of the integral and we just have work equals force vector dot displacement vector where that dot product indicates a vector dot product where, well, a scalar product where we would have the work equals force times distance times the cosine of the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. But keeping the integral form in mind is often useful if we're dealing with continuous charge distributions and the potential energy that would exist in setting up a continuous charge distribution. So here's one way that we can make sense of this. Remember back in kindergarten physics that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per square second and the vector acceleration would be that magnitude in the downward direction. Now another way of writing this is that g vector, in other words, um, or at least a vector equals negative g times j hat is equal to 9.8 newtons per kilogram in the downward direction. A newton per kilogram is the same thing as a meter per square second, but we wrote it this way so that we can make an analogy between the electric field units of newtons per coulomb. In other words, 9.8 meters per square second, i.e. 9.8 newtons per kilogram, is the gravitational field strength, just as some number of newtons per coulomb is the electric field strength. So in other words, when we talk about a gravitational field, we are literally talking about the rate at which an object would accelerate if dropped in a gravitational field. So in other words, if you tell me how many kilograms of mass I put in that gravitational field, I'll tell you how many newtons of force is going to act on it. Analogously, you tell me how many coulombs of charge you're going to put in the electric field, I'll tell you how many newtons of force is going to act on that charge. So, one of the somewhat pedantic things that was often done in, particularly in AP Physics 1, not so much AP Physics C mechanics, but to some extent there as well, is talking about the work done by a gravitational field, which is kind of a strange concept and not always all that meaningful, but you can definitely talk about the work done by an electric field on a charged particle in some uniform electric field. So back in kindergarten physics we said that the work done by a gravitational field was equal to um, let's just say H instead of Y but MGH initial minus MGH final. In other words the initial energy that the particle had minus the final energy. Notice that we switched our negatives here. That's because the work done by a field is equal to the negative of the change in potential energy. Well, we've discussed before, really, um, at least in passing, that the potential energy of a charge in an electric field, a constant electric field at least, is QES, where S is the position of the charge. Well, analogously to the gravitational field, we can say that the work done by an electric field is equal to QES initial minus QES final. So, again, the reason I kind of um, get a little bit antsy when talking about the work done by a gravitational field is because the idea of work being done by a conservative force field is a bit misleading. 
because after all, I mean, energy is conserved and it's simply the object is moving around in the field and exchanging kinetic energy and potential energy. But it's nonetheless useful in allowing us to come up with an equation for the potential energy in a constant electric field. So remembering that the work done by a field is equal to the negative of the change in the potential energy in that field, that allows us to say that the potential energy of some particle in the electric field, the electric potential energy U, is equal to its potential energy at some particular spot, which we label, the spot we label zero, so its potential energy there will be labeled U sub zero, or U naught, plus QES, where S is the distance measured from um, what's usually a negative plate, where, where we're talking about the potential energy being zero. This is very similar to the gravitational field, where we say, okay, let's just define the poten gravitational potential energy to be a certain value at the ground. We'll come back to that concept of ground in physics in electricity soon. But at the ground, we'll call that potential energy u naught. Any distance s or y or h above the ground is going to give you a potential energy of u naught plus mgh m being the um, mass, i.e. the thing that will get potential energy by existing in that field, times the field strength times the height. Well, notice that I was pointing to Q, E, and S here. So the charge is analogous to mass, the electric field is analogous to gravitational field, and S is analogous to height where S is the distance from the negative plate. And of course if you release a positive charge in between a positive and negative plate, the charge is going to accelerate down toward the negative plate at constant acceleration. Sound familiar? And just as with the gravitational field, in truth, the only thing we really care about is the change in potential energy. In other words, we don't usually care about the absolute value of the potential energy at that particular spot. We will, however, care about an absolute electric potential, but that's going to be a little bit later. Now, also, another one of those pedantic things that particularly comes up in AP Physics 1 because they don't do advanced math, so they have to add a bunch of stuff that, in truth, is meaningless in a lot of cases. What we really mean when we talk about an object in a gravitational field is the potential energy of the mass plus Earth system. And there, there have even been AP exam problems where you, you can't get full credit unless you un, un, understand and make it very explicit that we're talking about the mass plus Earth system. Um, so if an apple's being dropped, you have to talk about the apple plus Earth system. The vast majority of the time in real applications, that's completely meaningless, or at least useless. And you can generally just um, talk about the potential energy of the object in the field. Same thing goes with a charge in a parallel plate capacitor. Technically that's the potential energy of the charge plus capacitor system. The difference though is that when you're talking about masses in gravitational fields, the gravitational field generally is constant, unless you're talking about um, planets interacting with each other or something like that. However, in a lot of this class, the electric field will not be constant because you'll be talking about electric interactions between individual charges. So it's really only constant if you're talking about something like a parallel plate capacitor or something like that, or if you are sufficiently close to a, an object with a relatively constant surface charge density near the point where your charge is. What about diagrams? Back in kindergarten physics, whatever, whether it was AP Physics 1 or AP Physics C Mechanics, you were introduced to the concept of potential energy diagrams. In fact, you probably examined problems like these on the AP exam or other types of exams, which are these graphical representations of how kinetic and potential energy transform as a particle moves. The point, and we're going to show an example of this soon, the point is that in the energy diagram for a charged particle in an electric field, we're generally assuming that it's a positively charged particle. If it's projected against the uniform field, well, 
if it's positive charge and you're going against the electric field, that's kind of like going up the waterfall for a massive object, it's going to gradually slow down with that kinetic energy being transformed to potential energy until it eventually reaches a turning point, which is where the potential energy is equal to the total energy, i.e. there's no kinetic energy left, it's all potential energy. So potential energy is usually given as a plot versus position as it's going to be in the example I'm about to show. So if particles potential energy is known, the turning points are where the total energy is equal to the potential energy. And by turning points we mean it turns around and goes back the other way. Because if the kinetic energy, or sorry, if the potential energy is equal to the total energy, again, there's no kinetic energy left over. So let's consider the following example that I'm going to show on the next slide. Where can the particle exist at the various energies shown? And what is the meaning of the points where the tonal energy is equal to the potential energy? And what if the potential energy is actually equal to the, if the total energy is actually equal to the potential energy at the bottom or top of a hill? Here is the example. Looks complicated and nasty. Here's the thing. The black curve represents potential energy as a function of position. Like let's say we've set up a certain type of charge distribution as a function of radius and it's say spherically symmetric or it's just one dimensional but you can't have r less than zero and that charge distribution makes a potential energy diagram like this so that if you tell me what the position is I'll um, read off the chart what the potential energy is question is what's going on in these various potential energy or various energy levels well let's consider a particle with energy e1 down here if you tell me that there's a particle with an energy of e1 i'll tell you that you're lying because a particle of energy e1 cannot exist in this potential energy diagram in order to have total energy of e1 it would have to have negative kinetic energy you can't have negative kinetic energy because you would have to have imaginary speed and only Chuck Norris can attain imaginary speed. So particles can't have energy E1. How about energy E2? If it has energy E2, then it can exist anywhere between um, coordinates R2 and R3. So what if you have a particle with energy E2? Well, it's going to be going back and forth between R2 and R3. And at the point in between where the potential energy is least, which I have labeled with the coordinate r sub a, that's where the kinetic energy is greatest. And then let's say it's going toward the right, it's kinetic energy, sorry, kinetic energy starts at zero at r2, and it's going to the right. As it moves to the right, um, it turns this potential energy into more and more kinetic energy until it reaches Ra. And then as it continues moving to the right, yeah, it has momentum, but it's slowing down as this kinetic energy gets transformed back into potential energy until at R3, all of the energy is potential energy, and it's reached a turning point again, and it goes back. So it just goes back and forth between R2 and R3. What about a particle with total energy E3? Well, that one can go back and forth between points R sub 1 and R sub 4. Or it can go back and forth between points R5 and R6. In other words, if it has total energy E3, its position is undefined unless we're given some sort of additional information. So it could be either between R2 and R4, or, or sorry, R1 and R4, or between R5 and R6. Now, what about a particle with energy E4? A particle with energy E4 can be at any position less than or equal to R7. So it might start at um, zero and go down real quickly in potential energy, gaining a lot of kinetic energy, and then move to the right, slowing down as that kinetic energy gets converted into potential energy, and then speeding up again past R sub B, where it gets converted back into kinetic energy, and then slowing down again as it approaches R6. Well, in that case, the, or sorry, sorry, R7, R7. We're looking at energy E4. So as it approaches R7, 
it can be anywhere less than R7, but once it approaches R7, it's going to slow down until it reaches the turning point and repeats the process. What about particles that have energies that just barely touch the graph here? What about energy E sub A? So at energy E sub A, the particle can only exist at location R sub A. And that's it. That's the only place where it can be. Whereas if it has energy E sub B, what if you put it at R sub B? R sub B is a point of what we call unstable equilibrium. Because if you just barely nudge the particle, if you barely nudge it to the right, it's going to end up going off toward the right and then turning around just past R6 because you've nudged it and given it a hair of kinetic energy there. And then come back and slow down to almost stop at RB and then go forward back and repeat the process. If you just barely nudge it to the left, then it's going to go off to the left and then turn around at R equals zero and then come back up. And then once it approaches R sub B, it's going to slow down, almost stop. But since you had nudged it to the left, giving it a little kinetic energy, it's going to have some of that left over. And it's going to move off to the right and go just past R6 again. And the cycle will repeat. So yeah, R sub B is a point of unstable equilibrium. Whereas point R sub A is a point of stable equilibrium. If you put a particle at R sub A at rest and you just barely nudge it, it's just going to go yip, 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 oscillating in small oscillations about R sub A. So those are the types of conclusions that you can draw from these types of energy diagrams. What about the potential energy of point charges? Obviously a point charge does not give you an electric field. Well, what you can do is you can start with the integral version for the equation for work because after all work is equal to force times distance and that the force between two point charges is kq1 q2 over r squared and then you can integrate that back to find out what kind of kinetic energy they would have once they're released or what because of the work being done by the electric field in, in that situation and you would eventually find that that potential energy that they must have had in order to acquire that kinetic energy if they're released from rest is given by k q1 q2 over r where k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Well that's the equation for the electric potential energy between two point charges of magnitudes q1 and q2 and separated by a distance of r. Now notice that this looks kind of like the equation for the force. In fact, it is the equation for the force except somebody took away an exponent. That's because of the integration that took place. And there was an exponent of negative 2 on the r, and the negative is gone as well. You would expect that when you integrate you get a negative. Well, it kind of goes back to the fact that the work done by the electric field is equal to the negative change in potential energy. And that's kind of part of that negative sign, but you could also think of it as going back to this diagram right here. What if your particle here had energy E3 and you put it at the point R1? What's it going to do? Well, it's going to accelerate off to the right. Why? It's going to accelerate off toward the right because there's a force acting on it toward the right. Why is there a force? There's a force because of the fact that points that are just to the right of R sub 1 have a lower potential energy. Whenever there is a difference in potential energy, a potential energy differential, an object will feel a force. And that force vector in one dimension would be given by the negative derivative with respect to position of the potential energy times the unit vector in that direction. If it's in multiple dimensions, then you actually need to take a gradient. In other words, um, take derivatives with respect to each dimension and slap a unit vector for that dimension on them and add them all together. So just using this, you can actually go backward from Coulomb's law to obtain this result for the potential energy between two point charges. But you can also do it using the force equation and the definition of work. So for example, Let's say you have four one gram spheres in this figure and you release them simultaneously and allow them to move away from each other. How fast is each sphere going when they are very far apart? 
Well, what do we mean by very far apart? How far is very far? Very far means infinite. So to solve this, we're going to use conservation of energy. What's that? It says that the total initial energy is equal to the total final energy. Just writing this for a problem requiring conservation of energy on the AP exam would likely get you a point. So again, the potential energy that they have right now is going to transform into kinetic energy. Now keep in mind that the potential energy at the beginning is all, um, or the total energy at the beginning is all potential energy. So we've set them, these up at rest. And that's the potential energy due to all of these charges interacting with each other. It's that total potential energy that is going to get transformed into all kinetic energy at the end. But it's going to be the kinetic energy of four particles. In order to figure out the speed of an individual particle, um, we would need to divide our answer by four because luckily for us they each have the same mass so they're all going to be going at the same speed. If they didn't have the same mass then we would need to employ a conservation of momentum as well and figure out what would be the relative velocities of these particles at the end. So what we'll do is we'll find using conservation of energy, the final total kinetic energy, divide that by 4, and then use that to solve for the speed. So here we go. What's the total energy initially? Well, it's equal to the total potential energy plus the total kinetic energy. What is it at the end? It's equal to the total potential energy plus the total kinetic energy. Normally when we do these types of conservation of energy problems, at least when we've done them in the past, we haven't had sums over potential and kinetic energies. But here we do because we have multiple particles interacting with each other. Luckily, at the beginning, all of the velocities are zero, so we can get rid of our sum of ki. At the end, they're infinitely far away from each other, practically speaking, so we can get rid of the sum of uf, because Going back to the equation for potential energy between two point charges, there's a 1 over r factor there, so when r goes to infinity, potential energy goes to zero. So here's what we're left with. Well, what is that total potential energy at the beginning? Well, let's label the particles 1, 2, 3, and 4 going clockwise, starting with the upper left particle. There's going to be potential energy between particle 1 and particle 2. There's going to be potential energy between particle 1 and particle 3. There's going to be potential energy between particle 1 and particle 4. Okay, so three different potential energies associated with particle 1. There are also going to be three different potential energies associated with particle 2. Potential energy between particle 2 and particle 1. But wait, we already counted that one when we were counting up the potential energy for particle 1. So we don't want to count it twice. So new unique potential energies, well there's potential energy between particle 2 and particle 3 and potential energy between particle three, 2 and particle 4. So that's two new potential energies that we hadn't already counted. And similarly, for particle 3, well, potential energy between that and particles 1 and 2, we already counted those when we were dealing with particles 1 and 2. But there's also potential energy between particle 3 and particle 4. So there's one new term there. Now, with particle 4, we're already done because we already accounted for those potential energies when we were looking at each of the other particles. But in total, there are six different potential energy terms here. And all of them are going to contribute to the final total kinetic energy. Now, technically, this is 1 half mv1 squared plus 1 half mv2 squared plus, well, 1 half m1v1 squared plus 1 half m2v2 squared plus 1 half m3v3 squared plus 1 half m4v4 squared. But again, they all have the same mass. So I'm just going to call all those masses m. And because of symmetry and the way that we set these up, they're all going to have the same final speed. So we just took 1 half mv squared for one of them and multiplied by 4. So to solve for v, we're going to need to divide by 4. Then we're actually going to divide by 2 because of the 1 half term in the kinetic energy. And we'll divide by m. And take a square root. So for the edges, the edges are each one centimeter long, or 0.01 meters, and there are four of those edge terms in this potential energy sum. I'm just going to call each of those R5. And then we also have 
a couple of diagonal terms, which I'm going to call r sub 6. So we just did this to make things a little bit easier. And when we apply these substitutions and simplify the math a little bit before plugging in our numbers, we have, again, four edge terms plus two diagonal terms. And I took care of the four times a half there. So I'm going to cancel a factor of two and divide both sides by m. So there's my equation for the square final velocity. And now we're ready to take a square root. And then plug in the numbers. So here we go. And finally, we have 0.49 meters per second for the speed of each of these particles. Of course, there are four of them, so there are four kinetic energies, which makes sense. But if we're looking for the speed of a particular particle, then this is it, 0.49 meters per second. So again, we used the fact that when they were very far apart, the potential energy was equal to zero. And that's what we call the escape speed. If they're able to get very far apart from some initial setup, then we will say that they have reached escape velocity. So let's say that I had these as um, particles that would end up attracting each other. In other words, two positives and two negatives. In order to get them infinitely far apart, I would have needed to make them initially going at 0.49 meters per second. In fact, actually it would be more complicated than that because of the fact that um, two pairs of those particles would actually be repelling each other. So I would have to make them go at actually a smaller speed than that, or a smaller speed than that would be sufficient to cause them to escape. But it's analogous to escape velocity in a gravitational field. Let's consider the potential energy of a dipole in a constant electric field. So remember that the dipole moment between um, two charges of opposite sign is given by the magnitude of one of the charges times the vector going from the negative charge to the positive charge. That's just the definition of the dipole moment. And that's, that's a position vector, the position vector going from the negative charge to the positive charge times the magnitude of each charge. That's the dipole moment. That's it. Well, remember that back in kindergarten physics, early in kindergarten physics, you learned that um, a small amount of work being done by a force is given by that force times the small amount of displacement, assuming that you're going in the direction of the displacement with your force. Well, the analogous result for that with um, rotational motion is that if you're rotating something, the amount of little bitty work done is equal to the torque, the rotational analog of force, times the small little angle that you've undergone in the rotation. That is the rotational ana analogy to displacement. So dw equals tau d phi. But what is tau for the, that is the torque for this situation? Well, the torque we introduced, we got into that back in a previous chapter. The torque for that a dipole feels in an electric field is equal to the dipole moment times the electric field times the sine of the angle. So if you have a large angle, it's going to be like say 90 degrees, then it makes sense you're going to have a maximum magnitude of torque there. Now, in this expression, though, we have a negative sign. The negative sign should make sense if you think of this as follows. If you set this up in, as shown in the diagram, and just let this go, the electric field is going to perform a positive amount of work to rotate this to a smaller angle. But wait a second. The way we set this up, we called it a smaller angle. The, the angle will decrease. So the result of the electric field performing positive work on this thing, giving it kinetic energy, that is, rotational kinetic energy, would be to cause a negative value in delta phi, or d phi, 
So since the natural result of this is going to be d phi having a negative value, we have a negative sign in front of the whole expression so that the actual work done by the electric field is positive. Another way you can make this make sense is the fact that if the initial value, uh, so I mean the actual potential energy of this, um, once we work out this whole um, fact that the change in potential energy is equal to the negative work, amount of work done by the field, we get that the potential energy of the dipole is the negative dot product of p vector dot e vector. Well, if phi is zero, that cosine of phi is going to be one, and you're going to get a negative value. But if phi is 180 degrees, cosine of 180 is negative one, and you'll end up having a positive value. In other words, the closer the angle is to 180 degrees compared with zero, the more the potential energy is going to be. It's okay if the potential energy is negative at the end. The whole point is we only care about the difference in the potential energies. So the actual potential energy, the change in potential energy going from phi equals 180 degrees to phi equals zero would simply be 2pe in terms of magnitudes. That would be the change in potential energy. Um, in other words, if you started it from rest and gave it a slight nudge, then it would have 2pe of kinetic energy at the end, where, P, where e again is the electric field strength. So that's how this stuff works with potential energy of dipoles. Now, a lot of stuff about potential energy so far. In other words, it has potential energy has to do with the charge that you've put in itself. But what we usually care about when we're talking about electricity is not the potential energy that certain arbitrary charges would have, but what the electric field does to charges once you get the charges together. In other words, we care about the electric field itself and how the electric field causes certain things to change from place to place. That leads to the concept of the electric potential, the potential energy per unit charge, which is going to be the subject of our next video. Until then, thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.